I've been burned by this many a time. I think it was Andre Carpathi had a blog being like, be very paranoid and visualize every single input and output. And that's something that I've, I've learned the hard way, I think, doing machine learning projects. 100%. Welcome back to Math for Machine Learning exercise sessions. I am your host, deep learning educator, Charles Fry. I have with me here, growth ML engineer, Scott Condren. Hello. And we're going to jump into now our second session with the linear algebra exercises. So in the first session, we got used to this auto grader that would tell us whether our answers were right and give us feedback hopefully helpful feedback to help us uh, craft our answers and, and learn how to answer questions. And the other thing we did was talk about the core idea around linear algebra in this series, which is that linear algebra should be thought of like programming and not like algebra. And the main point that we got across last time was that matrices should be thought of as functions rather than as data, as something that takes in a vector and returns a vector. And we're gonna dive way deeper on that idea this time. And if you want uh, a more thorough explanation of those ideas, make sure to check out the slides and the videos for the lectures that accompany these exercises. So I'll give a quick reminder of what those ideas are. So the important thing about functions is not just that functions take in data and return data. It's that if I have two functions and the types match, so a function that outputs a Boolean and another function that takes in a Boolean, then I can combine them together. So I did an example with this too long to tweak function that breaks down checking whether a number is over 140 and checking the length of a string to take those two pieces and turn them into uh, a single function that checks whether a string is too long to go into a single tweak. So we're used to this idea in programming that we combine these functions together to create our programs, to create our actually useful functions. This is also a really key idea in linear, I'm scrolling down a little bit there. What we do to, how do we compose to matrices? When we compose to functions, we just call the second function with the output of the first function. And that's not quite what we do with matrices. With matrices, we multiply them together. We use matrix multiplication to multiply the two matrices together. So I have a matrix A and a matrix B, and I wanna compose them. So I apply the transformation A to a vector after applying the transformation B to a vector, then what I do is that matrix multiplication rule that we talked about where we take the rows, multiply them with the columns, sum it up. So that is really actually probably the right way to think of where that rule for matrix multiplication comes from is that it's the right way to define multiplication of matrices so that it's function composition. So actually, I honestly would prefer if we called it matrix composition or something like that rather than calling it multiplication, because I think that confuses people because it doesn't behave like the way you, things do when you multiply numbers. Mm -hmm. Our first exercise here, just to connect us back up with writing code and not just talking about math, is we're going to check whether two matrices are compatible with each other, whether I can do A times B as a matrix multiplication, just like I might write some checks before I run a function. I might check if my input actually is a string. In Python, you got to check stuff like that. Is it a string? Is it a non-negative number? Those kinds of checks. All right, Scott, our goal here is to return true if A at B is a valid matrix multiplication. There's a little hint above this question about how, we, how, you, would, how you would solve that. So what do we need to check here? Um, the hint, where is the hint that? Uh, yeah, so. Um, um, the hint, where is the hint that? Yeah, that part right there. Columns of A must equal the number of rows. B. Okay, yes, it's 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 to do with the shape of these two, and it's just so I guess we can do A rows is mm -hmm. A dot shape and get the first element of it. Yep, and then we could do B columns, and that would be B dot shape, and that would be the second part of that dimension of that, and then we just return if the rows are equal to the columns, and that should do it. Yeah, let's check it with the grader. Let's check it with the grader. Ooh, interesting. All right, when the inner shapes are the same, do, do, do. Ah, okay. Let's actually, so we didn't quite get it this time. Okay. Right. The number of columns of A must equal the number of rows of B. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think we might have said it backwards. Okay, we can just fix it. That should do it. Yeah, 
Three. Okay. Yeah. So that is, that's because we line up each row of A with each column of B, which then means that the number of columns of A must equal the number of rows of B. For me, I have to picture like grabbing a hold of one row and grabbing a hold of the column of the next one and then combining them together. So that's where the inspiration for the cover image for this video series came from. This cover image. Yeah, okay. That one. Cool. So that's showing that this is equal to the same length as this. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. All right. So that just, that's just to get us back in terms of thinking about like shapes and types, right? <laughs> so we use types to determine which functions we can bind together. We use shapes to determine which matrices and, and tensors and arrays we can combine together. So now let's actually start using our idea of composing things to make a more complicated function. So last time we define two matrices, one called set second to zero and one called repeat three, two. Repeat three, two took a length two vector and repeated it three times and set second to zero set the second entry of a vector to zero. So what we want to do now is define a new matrix that sets the second entry to zero and repeats the result three times. Okay. That's fine. So I will not look up and see if. Maybe I, I might need to in a bit. So if I remember correctly, setting to zero was we had an array, a list of lists, or, mm -hmm. and it was the first had a one, mm -hmm. zero. And then I think the second had a zero and a zero. Yep. That's our set to zero. Yeah. And now we need to repeat three times. And that was to stack the output. Is that, is that correct? Like we want to have the, the number that you get given three times as the output. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So just create a new cell above this one and just check to see if those two matrices set second zero and repeat three, two are defined. Cause I think we made them last time. Okay. Yeah. So we should have those two available. Okay. So we don't, I didn't need to do this. Yeah. You didn't necessarily have to redefine the matrices and you certainly, what you definitely don't want to do is try and rewrite this as, you know, the actual raw matrix that you would get. It's sort of like how you like write code once in a function and then you reuse it lots of other places. You know, you write a matrix once and then you define all the other matrices you want to use in terms of matrix multiplications and other operations on that matrix. Okay, so I did fall in nicely to the trap of thinking, okay, I'll do one big matrix to solve these two where I should have composed them together to make uh, one after the other. and. What I'm now realizing is, as you've just explained, that would be a matrix multiplication to do that composition. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So order matters here. So order does matter. Unlike normal multiplication with matrix multiplication, order matters. Just like with function composition, order matters. Okay. My intuition is it's backwards. When we write functions, we write the last function first, which is just like this artifact of kind of the history of mathematics and how people were thinking about functions when they first came up with the notation versus now. But yeah, you're exactly right. It works backwards with the normal way of writing matrix multiplication and the normal conventions with the normal way of writing functions. There are alternative conventions that make it read left to right. I guess if you speak maybe Hebrew or, or Arabic, then this might feel a little bit more natural to you to go from right to left. But yeah, you're right. It's reversed. So let's check this one. I think this is right. Okay. But I use the grader to check whether my answers are right too. Nice. So I, I'm pretty happy that I redeemed myself there. And Nailed it. Okay, nice. Yeah, no, I've placed many traps to, to maximize the educational impact. Just as when programming, we can write just one function that does multiple steps or write a separate function for each step. When we're in linear algebra, we can either do one matrix to apply all of our transformations or a separate matrix for each transformation. And there's just like with programming, sometimes that can have performance, you know, there could be performance reasons for doing one or the other. And sometimes there's clarity reasons for doing one or the other. It's clearer. Often, if you've got like four different names for four different steps of your pipeline to write them all out so that somebody else coming in to change your code or understand what it's doing can see it. Other times, maybe that slows you down by a factor of 10 and that's not a good idea. With that in mind, we're going to do a sort of word problem version of this coding exercise. So you're looking through a fellow developer's code and you notice that in their pipeline, which is written as a function below. A large amount of data is being passed through four successive matrix operations. In order, the data vectors, V, are multiplied by W, then X, then Y, and finally by Z. 
and you think you can get out, maybe squeeze out some additional performance by turning this into one matrix multiplication, call it capital V. So what I want you to do here, Scott, is use matrix multiplication to define that array V here. Okay. So what I'm trying to think of is like, can I just do the last first and then do times Y times times X times W. And Not it. like, first of all, is this legal? And then second of all, does this work? I can at least tell you that's legal, but go ahead and run those two cells above first so that the variables uh, oh, yeah. of those matrices are defined. So yeah, that's legal. Great. I don't actually remember most, you know, most Python syntax. I don't remember it. I just have a linter to check it for me or I run the cell and see if it works. I keep those, I keep that space in my brain for useful information, Lord of the Rings lore and mathematics. Let's check if it's right. Let's run the grader and see what happens. Oh, great. Nailed it. Nice. So just a quick note, one for purpose of this question is to make sure that people have figured out that like left, right thing, that tricky thing where it's not written in the right way. So just go ahead and humor me and write W, X, Y, Z instead of uh, Z, Y, X, W. Oh, okay. I will drag them around W, X, Y. It doesn't work. So make sure you multiply in the right order. That's the little test there. So that's intended to, for you to be like, oh, wait, what is the right order to multiply things? It looks like what my test is checking is that it's checking if I multiply W, X, Y, Z with a random vector, is it the same as what happens when I multiply your V with a random vector? That shouldn't be the case because your V should be Z, Y, X, W instead of W, X, Y, Z. Okay. And am I right in saying that like, I, I can think of it like this, does it evaluate in that way? That is a good question about the like operator precedence in Python, whether you would do it from right to left or left to right. So the first answer is that you could add parentheses and make it evaluate in any of those orders and it would be valid. So you um, did left to right. Um, you could also do it right to left. So first do X and W, then do Y with that, then do Z with the whole thing. Okay. So, so even it's uh, something like this is right where. Yeah. yeah go ahead and run that. I, I'm pretty positive that'll work. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. So it doesn't matter what order they, they happen in terms of which goes first. It just matters like left to right, which if they're in the right order, then it works. Yes. This is okay. called associativity. That's the math term for this. And it means that we don't need to care the sort of like order that we do these things in. And it's super, that's like a very common axiomatic property of things we like to study in math is that the order of parentheses doesn't matter. It really makes our lives a lot easier to have that. Importantly, one thing that does mean is we wrote Y as just like a single thing. You took Y at X, you wrapped it in parentheses and you turn, and basically what you did was you turned that into a single matrix. Yeah. Exactly. Um, right now we have a bunch of single matrices here, Z, Y, X, W. There's no reason why we have to think of those as a single matrix. I could, I could turn Z into a composition of matrix multiplications if I wanted to. I can decompose anything down to its like atomic elements and turn it basically into like individual numbers or individual vectors that have just one number that's not zero as maybe the, the like atomic element here and then stack them and combine them and matrix compose them to get the final big matrix. The nice thing about this view of linear algebra is it really emphasizes that what we are doing is stacking and composing these small, simple atomic pieces. Cool. Uh, so now we're gonna, f we're gonna take a different tack on understanding what matrices do. So when you apply a matrix to a vector, it's like the right way to think about that matrix is as a function. When you have two matrices that you're multiplying together, there's kind of two ways that both might be good of thinking about it, and it depends on which application you're doing. If you're taking two matrices that are both going to, in the end, be multiplied with vectors, to give you results, then it's nice to think of it as matrix composition, like we did with set second to zero and repeat three. Right way to think of that matrix multiplication as composing functions. But one common example where people do multiplication of matrices, when you're doing machine learning, you have batches of inputs. You have multiple inputs going in at once. Uh, and in that case, it is a matrix multiplication because you're multiplying two matrices together, but it's maybe more fruitful to think of the matrix multiplication as doing a kind of for loop, applying the same matrix on the left to a bunch of vectors one after another, where they're the columns of the input. So I think you may have come across like this idea of batches or mini batches of vectors in machine learning, right, Scott? Yeah, yeah. So that's when you have, say, 
a big data set and you want to just calculate your gradients on one small subset of that as you uh, train. Right. Go ahead and run that cell, actually, so we've got some, like, some concrete vectors to look at. Okay. So on the top there, we've got all the vectors put together into one matrix. And then on the bottom, we have each vector printed out separately. So now we've got our batch of vectors on the top and then the separate vectors on the bottom. Just to confirm where are each of those vectors in the bottom from the bottom thing in our batch. Oh yeah, nice little space there. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> okay. So yeah, a mini batch here in, as you're looping over this is giving me like these two numbers and then these two numbers and then these. So it's like uh, that flipped. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. It's each column is what we yeah. get. So okay. fundamentally what we're doing here is when we think of matrices as functions, we're really thinking of them as a collection of row vectors. Yeah. Uh, each okay. row vector could be applied to a, a valid input to the matrix, and it would give you a single number just by the dot product. When we think of matrices as a batch of vectors, we th we're thinking of them in terms of their columns. Yeah, okay. So both, like the default way that matrices are written in NumPy is to think of them in terms of their rows, and so to think of them in terms of functions, which is maybe a nice feature of, of NumPy. But we can always think of them in terms of their columns. And if we use the transpose, then we'll have turned the rows into the columns. Okay. I guess where I'm thinking is how does this translate into function composition versus for loop? Right. That's yeah. Uh, so maybe scrolling down a little bit. From this perspective, if we multiply a matrix F with a matrix batch of vectors, we're defining a new batch of vectors equal to F times each element of the original batch. So it's like a for loop where it's a four vector in batch of vectors, apply F to the first one, apply F to the second one, apply F to the left, to each one, and then return it as a new batch of vectors. So each one that I just named is a column of the output. Okay, okay. So if, for example, say thinking of our previous example of set two to zero, if we had a bunch of things that we wanted to set two to zero, we would put them in this format where each column needs to have the set to zero, and then it will do that. It'll set that two to zero for each thing in that input. Let's give that a shot and try set second to zero, just that one, and then at batch of vectors. There we go. Great. Okay. We've given it in these two rows, and then it's transposed them and set the second to zero, which has given us, so that two is gone to zero, that four is gone to zero, and the output is also transposed. Oh no, the output's the same shape as the- uh, The output's the same shape, yeah. Like, the only reason I've got a transpose in there is just because by default, if you loop over a matrix in NumPy, you get the rows, because NumPy, it's called row major. We think of the Perfect. rows first and the columns second. So I did that transpose just to loop over it, but inside the matrix multiplication, there's not necessarily going to be a, like transposing happening. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. So this is more just for, for visual, like to, to, to print it out and because of the way for loops work in NumPy, but this is the right way to think about matrix multiplication is it is happening on the columns. Yeah. Think of the thing on the right as it's happening on the columns and the thing on the left as it's coming from the rows. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, if you took a linear algebra class, the way that this idea is expressed is in terms of the row space and the column space. That's a common way of talking about it in mathematical terms, which emphasizes which vectors you can construct and stuff like that, which is, it's useful uh, and it's good for analyzing whether matrix algorithms are going to converge and all this kind of stuff. But it's actually not my favorite way of thinking about what's happening in an actual concrete linear algebra program that I've written uh, in a neural network, uh, rather than thinking in terms of these like spaces being transformed into one or another, I think of them in terms of these computational operations, like a for loop. Cool. Yeah, that this is nice. That makes a lot more sense. It's, it's like a for loop. It's even maybe even more like a list comprehension. A list comprehension is all about constructing new lists from old lists by applying functions. Okay, cool. Uh, so what we're going to do here is we're going to write a function that makes this explicit, this idea that we're doing a for loop explicit rather than just doing F at batch of vectors, which would apply the matrix F to each column of the matrix batch of vectors. We want to do it explicitly here. Okay. And I guess I'll try to do it within a list comprehension. So there's, yeah. the, there's an ethos of programming that I like, which is make it run make it right, make it fast. And those are three steps separate from one another, decomposed. So let's, let's make it run first. That sounds good. Okay. So for 
uh, batch in batch of vectors. And then we do our transpose. I would think of it as vector in batch of vectors. Does that make sense? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Vector in batch of vectors. And then I want to do f dot append, or I guess it's, it's not append. It's more like extend, is it? Append will, append will work. Okay. Now I want to do f applied to, so can I do f is, f is just a function? Or it's a matrix. Okay. F is a matrix, and you can. We know that it's that it's compatible with with the vectors that are coming in. Is it that like I'm every time I'm going function, and then like thinking of it like input. Yeah, I'm, I have to go. Okay, no, so it's the opposite of that because. So, it's actually you had it right the first time. It's F at vector. Oh, is it okay? Yeah. So with the inputs come in from the right, and then they pass through a sequence of operations. You can imagine them going on like a little conveyor belt from right to left. From right to left. Okay. Yes. That makes sense. So this is getting applied to this. F that is getting applied to the vector. Uh, sorry. Yes. Vector is getting fed to F. Yeah. That's getting fed. And it, that's your conveyor belt. Okay. That makes yeah. sense. And then I want to return it. Have you ever played Factorio, Scott? I have not played Factorio or heard of it. What okay. is it? It's just a, it's a video game and it's got conveyor belts in it. Okay. Uh, so one quick thing, we want the return type to be an array, just makes it easier for me to check whether your function is implemented correctly. So I would just. Oh yeah. Just wrap it here. Yeah. At the end. 50% passed. 50% passed. We're moving. Okay. So what this is, what this test is telling you is that if I apply the identity matrix to some vectors, I don't get the right answer. And the particular problem we're getting is rather than getting the wrong answer, we're getting an error and it's a shape error. Okay. I see this. Operations could not be broadcast with shapes. 10, 5, 5, 10. Maybe for my own sake, I'll print out the shapes here of this mm -hmm. and this. So I know what I'm actually printing. I'll print the space. And before running the grader, go ahead and insert a code cell above this one. Mm -hmm. uh, and go ahead and do use your apply to batch function on one of the functions we've defined before and our batch of vectors. And our batch of vectors. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. We've already defined that as well. Oh, that's not very useful. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I want to use a different one. Yeah, let's see. We don't have any non-square matrices ready to go. Try repeat three, two. Yeah. Yeah, there it is. That's working. That works. Strange. All right. What's our bug here? All right. So repeat three, two on a batch of vectors. Go ahead and print batch of vectors for me. Okay. Okay. I think I see the problem. So remember the batch of vectors, each column is an input. And what we'd love is if our output you know, looks like our input in that each column of the output corresponds to a column of the input. Nailed it. Yeah. Let's nice. try it. So what Scott did was transpose the output. Okay. So let's see how that works then. Errors. Uh, but got, okay. So we don't, the prints are killing us. So we have to get rid of that. Yeah. The way that this grader works is it's how people check doc strings in Python. And it's very okay. sensitive to how the, what the outputs look like very precisely. Well, we've got two pass nodes, so that nailed it. Yeah, so tracking those transposes and shapes and keeping track of what's a row and what's a, what's a column is one of the trickiest parts. And the unfortunate news is that each matrix library has maybe slightly different conventions. Like PyTorch, I think, actually likes to think of it as going from left to right rather than right to left. Like they tr they just transpose everything relative to the normal convention. And you kind of got to like develop some heuristics, check shapes like we just did, think through whiteboard stuff and make sure you've got all your conventions in order to solve these kinds of problems. I've been burned by this many a time. Yeah. And, you know, even something like you get your output and then you want to reshape it to like be the shape you expect it to. Mm -hmm. That can get you a lot as well because you might have accidentally transposed it somewhere in the middle. And now your, your batch is actually your feature dimension or something mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. And that, that has gotten me many times. I think it was Andre Carpathia had a blog, be very paranoid and visualize every single input and output. And that's something that I've, I've learned the hard way, I think, doing machine learning projects. 100%. And in fact, the, the future definitely, I think within a year, maybe two years, depending on how quickly, like some research and development on this goes, 
it should be easier to work with tensors in some of the main tensor libraries because people are working on typing for tensors that keeps track of the shapes for you. And before you even run your code, it'll say, hey, wait a second, these two things don't line up. And there's just some, there's some like really gnarly, tricky math and programming language theory stuff that has to be figured out and then implemented in Python before that can happen. But it'll make all of our lives easier soon. That sounds great. Yeah. All right. Uh, so we talked about one form of parallelization in linear algebra, which is like doing a for loop and kind of like, especially if you run that on the GPU and on a lot of modern CPUs, the actual computation is going to look very different from what you just wrote in apply to batch. In apply to batch, we were very explicit that we want to grab each vector, apply a matrix to it, return it to the output. And while that's going to give you the same result, it's way slower than the actual NumPy code will be because it gets parallelized under the hood in a smart way. Okay. So what we're going to talk about now is a different type of parallelization. One type of parallel programming is let's apply the same operation to multiple inputs. The other type of parallel programming is what if we applied multiple operations to the same input at the same time? Yeah. For example, maybe I have two matrices that I want to apply to an input and I want to get those two outputs. Like I want to get both the like length three output of one matrix and the length four output of the other matrix on some input. We can do that just by stacking matrices, stacking two matrices on top of each other. So is that on a diff, on a, like a new dimension? If I've got like a two by two matrix that I'm applying and then another two by two, is it just going to be a two by four or is it going to be two and then two by twos? That's a great question. So you could do it either way, but the main way in order to keep things like matrices and vectors, the sort of like default way to do it is to stack them. And so you would get a, in the case that you described, you'd get a length four vector as output instead of getting something with an extra dimension added onto it. But the fun thing is that so long as the number of entries are the same, you can always just reshape. I can take a matrix that's two by two and turn it into a length four vector. I could take a length 10 vector and turn it into a two by five or a five by two or a 10 by one. Often you could reshape things and turn what used to be an operation on vectors to an oper operation on matrices or upgrade it to tensors with 10 dimensions or whatever. And as long as you're keeping track of the shapes, you can always map them onto each other. So it's a convention that we do this stacking directly on the vectors rather than anything else. <laughs> Cool. Let's go ahead and run this cell for me. So what we're doing here is we're taking a matrix that's this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and splitting it up into its rows first. And then we're checking whether taking the matrix and multiplying it by the vector, by some vector, gives us the same result as taking each row and multiplying it with the vector for all of the rows. Okay. I'm going to really quickly print what rows is here. Yeah. Good idea. So it's now each one of these. Yeah. So this is what I was hoping it will be. Mm -hmm. Cool. Then we have a matrix times this vector. And we want to just check if this is the same as this stacked. Right. We just got to do a quick thing where we, where we make sure that the shapes are right. Um, mm -hmm. that, that stack there is sort of putting the results back into the right final shape there. Okay. The four, I just might want to see what this looks like. It, oh, that's already happening here actually. Okay. Yes. So that is this print that and print that. Yeah. Okay, so it's the same, right. but by doing stack, it ends up turning it into a, a numpy array that's not like this, but it's column. These are each column. Is that what I'm, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, you got it. So it's an annoying little bit that like H stack there is just like an annoying little trick to like really quickly turn it into an array and have it be the right shape. The important thing is that what what is the matrix doing? It's taking each row and applying it to the input vector. So when I do matrix add vector, it's the same thing as doing a for loop over the rows where I apply each row to the vector. So these are the two dual or complementary, you might think of it, views of matrices. Either when, when we have two matrices multiplied together, we can either think of it as a batch of inputs going into the matrix on the left, and I'm transforming each one one after another, or I can think of the rows of the matrix as applying individual functions to each input. Okay. Okay. So in order to get our final matrix, we're kind of building it by stacking the rows on top of each other here. But there's not really anything special about a like matrix with only one row here. We could also stack matrices with multiple rows. And that's how we're able to get this parallel programming thing where we stack one matrix on top of another and apply basically two functions to the same input. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And even it, it, and it just matters that they're stackable. If you stack, say, one matrix and another matrix, which are the two functions you want to apply, what, will they not like bleed in or like be affect each other? They're completely independent. They're completely independent. And importantly, the only thing that matters is that they need to both be functions that can take the same input. It wouldn't make sense to try and apply both a function that checks how long a string is and a function that checks if a number is greater than 140 to the same input because you can't be both a string and a number. So similarly, we want our matrices to have the same number of columns. Okay. Okay, cool. So, so long as your new function has the same number of columns, it can be applied. So I could have one function that's like this, and then another function like this, stack them. Mm -hmm. And it's like being, it's like composing them or doing yep. them in parallel. Composing them in parallel. Exactly. And in fact, you picked the exact example that I'm going to use in this next cell here. So if you run the <laughs> next cell. Okay. Oh, nice. This. So some of those prints are a little ugly there. Sorry about that. We've got the matrix. Right, maybe actually you maybe walk us through what we've printed here. Okay, so I'm going to do my space trick. Here's just this printed. There's all our columns. And then you split it. And then you do the same here, but with the other side. So this is from like zero to two and this from two to the end. Mm -hmm. And that ends up being this, which is this little sub, sub uh, matrix. And then this is the final part. And finally, then you do what we did in the last thing, but this time you're looping over the splits and you're applying them rather than looping over the rows. Ah, interesting. So you're going this and then this, as opposed to row, row. And this kind of ties into the fact that what, what you were telling me earlier is to how they compose nice. Right. Yeah. So we just check in that last bit that, bit that we're getting the same answers here. And that H stack again is just to get, if I do these, if I do these, if I do this form style, like I'm adding some extra dimensions, they just need to get like removed or squeezed out. And that's what's, that's what's happening in that H stack there. So actually I was, cause last time I was, I was looking at this and I was like, why isn't this just that? Because that would have worked just fine for this array. And now I realize why you did it ahead of time. Cause it was, you were like, if I do it array here and then I introduce H stack here, it makes it confusing. But because you do H stack in both, it's just saying this will just get rid of these like little annoying middle parentheses. Is that, am I correct? Yeah. This is a list with two length, two arrays in it, which, you know, a human can look at that and say, oh yeah, those are the, those two things are the same, <laughs> but they're not exactly the same. They're just. There's like an equivalence. I can turn one into the other really easily. And, but computers are very pedantic. And so they will say, no, those are not the same. So each stack is what's making them actually the same as each other. Okay. So yeah, this, the, I just added that there just to see that it printed correctly. And this is interesting. I, I don't think I've ever used that. So this could be a bit. H stack and V stack are these two functions that you can use to combine arrays in a nice way. You may not, like if you're using a higher level library on top of, of an array library, you might not need them that much because they'll do this sort of thing for you, but it's a useful way to play around with it's these sorts of things are actually much more common in MATLAB, which is my first programming language, like these kinds of array operations. I also did MATLAB in, in my undergrad. It's a, it's a gateway drug to neural, neural networks. <laughs> All right, so let's let's close out here by working using this v stack function. Uh, in addition to h stack, there's also this function v stack that basically undoes that splitting operation that I did above. So I had that that splits equals matrix up to two and two to the n. So I split it by its rows. V stack can basically undo any way you might have split up a matrix by its rows into like maybe you know more than two pieces, like ten pieces or something. So v stack will vertically stack the input arrays on top of one another. So it works on any matrices that have the same number of columns. What does it mean for two matrices to have the same number of columns? It means that they can operate on the same input. So V stack is our parallel composition tool. And just like at was our serial composition tool, that matrix multiplication was in order to apply two matrices in serial to an input. Now we're thinking of applying matrices in parallel to an input. Okay. So just so I understand this here, I, I'm going to really quickly try something. So if I have an array and it's, let's say one dimension and another array, that's the same size. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I want to just stack them. Could I do MP dot V stack or V stack on that? Yeah. You got a comma at the beginning. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's. That makes sense. Instead of merging them where it would be like zero, zero in a list, it puts them like, it's like merging them column wise. Is that 
Yeah. Okay. Yep. So literally what it does is it like merges them column wise, but my preferred intuition for what VStack is for is for taking things that I might want to apply separately to the same input and parallel composing them. So stacking them on top of each other. Okay. Um, yeah. So sorry, just again, that what, what one example is in, in terms of your functions, that would be like set second to zero. And then another function you want to apply in parallel, which would be repeat three, two. And then I've got now. You'll want to turn that okay. into a list, but. Would that for this? And now I have, so one of these was set second to zero. Oh, it's th this one here. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of these were this repeat three, two. And now they're yep. composed, stacked on top of each other. That's cool. Uh, we're now going to use vStack to define what's kind of like a higher order function in linear algebra. This is a function that creates a matrix that repeats vectors of length n k times in their output. So this guy is going to create a matrix for you that that can do something like repeat three, two, but for any choice of length of input, which is two and number of times repeated, which was three. Okay. Let's say I didn't have to take these into consideration. Mm -hmm. If this was just like make a three, two repeater, I could just return one of these or repeat three. And that would be for three and two, or let's say, is that right? Yeah. 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 For three and two. Cool. Okay. I'm going to just remind myself something. I'm going to remind myself what repeat three, two looks like. Yeah. That was repeat three, two. That has an input of size N and that repeats at K times. That... There's two hints underneath this question. You might want to just quickly take a look at them. Okay. Calling the function mp.i with argument K returns a K times k identity matrix, mm -hmm. with a matrix with ones along the diagonal. When applied to any length k vector, it returns that vector. This might be useful in make repeater. Okay. And in an earlier exercise, you defined a repeater matrix that repeated length two inputs three times repeat three two. If you completed that exercise, then you could test your make repeater by comparing make repeater three two to repeat three two. They should be the same. So I've, so I was on a similar right track, at least to mm -hmm. be reminded of that. This will be my matrix at the end, but I'm struggling to remember what this means in terms of repeating three, two, because that was in our last session. Right. Right. I remember. Yeah. So what we have here, I think the right way to think about this, when we first talked about this, right, we actually, I think went like row by row and we were like, this one will grab the first entry. This one will grab the second entry. And then, oh, we want to do that three times. So we were thinking on this very row by row level, which is nice for being super concrete. We're now going to like ascend a level of thinking here and say, what we're really doing is we're applying the identity matrix to the input sort of three times, but not three times in a row, but three times on top of each other, three times in parallel. So do you see the three identity matrices there in repeat yeah. three, two? Yes. Okay. I do know. Yeah. These are three identity. So when they, okay. And now. I think I've gotten it. So what I want to do is have N identity matrix, which are of size K. So where I could be wrong with the K and N there, but what, what I want to do is have some way to choose how big the diagonal is and how many times it's stacked on top of each other. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. I guess I'll use MP.I as suggested. And mm -hmm. that function, I'll use my hover tool and see what it takes takes n so that's just how big is the identity okay sweet so that is and if this is repeat three two i want repeat repeat length n vector k times n vector k times a length n vector comes in and that's going to be my identity yeah i want to do yeah v stack and then i can just do this times or a I don't want to be too fancy here. Were you going to do like list multiplication? Yeah, I was going to do list multiplication, but I think I'll just do a list comprehension for that in range of K. Yeah. So just for the folks at home, just actually make a code cell above Scott and just while I'm explaining it, demonstrate list multiplication in Python. So in Python, you can take a list and repeat it as many times as you want by using multiplication. That'll give you list, but repeated again. Yeah, exactly. So what I was going to do is do that with my NumPy array, but I thought it might be a little bit too fancy, might be, might be tripping myself up. 
up. So mm -hmm. I went for a simple list comprehension and then wrapped it in VStack. Yep. Hoping this. Let's see correct. if it's right. And it is. Okay. It nice. Is. Yes. So yeah. So that does exactly what, what we wanted. And actually, I do like the for loop style. That's I think a, a good way of doing it. It's less terse than doing that multiplication, you know, list and then multiply. That's like way harder to visually parse. It's less obvious that you're doing this repetition. So yeah, I like this way of doing it. And it's correct. Uh so I think that might be all of our exercises. Would you go ahead and scroll down then, Scott? Mm -hmm. This is to check our and that is fine. That mm -hmm. looks correct. Yeah. So just to close out, there's no more exercises here, but I think the, the insights of the last two sections tell us that a matrix with shape M comma N can be thought of in two dual ways. It can be thought of as a length N batch of vectors of size M or as a sort of V stack of M matrices of shape one comma N. Uh, so depending on what the matrix is, you know, what it is and what it's being used for. One of these views can be more useful than the other, but it's a good idea to have both of those views in your pocket as like an immediate intuition you can bring when you're working with an array. So the matrices that define the inputs to a machine learning model are best thought of as batches of vectors, right? Because each one's an image and there's a bunch of images, whereas the matrices that get multiplied with those inputs, for example, in linear regression or in the first layer of a neural network, are best thought of as those like concatenated row vectors or these concatenated one by n matrices because each one of those is basically computing a different function on the input. In a neural network layer, we think of it as a feature detector, right? So I have a feature detector that's looking for one feature. It's a one by n weight matrix that are the weights of an individual neuron in the layer. And so then it becomes really useful to think of these as functions. And Importantly, like, I don't know, we had these kind of artificial examples of like repeat three, two and things like that. But when it comes to a neural network, we actually have these like little weights in there that are doing some kind of real computation that people really care about, like combining curves together to make circles in a convnet or, you know, computing relationships between words in a transformer model. And so they, they really actually do behave like this. And it's useful to have these ideas from linear algebra to understand what might be going on inside that goopy black box of a neural network that you're training. Oh yeah, this has been really great. And I think it's a, it's given me a new intuition to think about, especially the V stack of functions. That was something I hadn't, hadn't seen before. I think I'm used to thinking of batches of inputs and stuff, because as a machine le learning engineer, you, you're always reshaping your inputs and outputs. But I think when it comes to the innards of actually breaking down what's happening inside the black box, you're right that this intuition of a V stack of M matrices or matrices is really useful. And, and, and I'm definitely going to bring it into my work. Great. Yeah. All right. Well, next time we'll be talking about calculus to understand what's going on in gradients and gradient descent better. So I'm looking forward to that session. Me too.